All right, we're ready to look at our first cellular automaton. Now, first I should mention that CA has kind of a, um, there's a rich history of work, you know, that you could really look back into the, into the 1950s and work, look at the work of John von Neumann and Stanislaw Ulam. There are all sorts of interesting beginning uses of this idea of modeling behavior that we see in our world or behavior that we could imagine through CA-like principles. And again, uh, we're going to look at the game of life, which is a, a very well-known CA from the 70s. Um, uh, in, in, a, in a later set of videos. So we're oddly going to start kind of towards the end of this kind of history of cellular uh, automata, and we're going to look at the work of Stephen Wolfram. Now, <laughs> I'm going to stop this discussion right here and point you to, if you're really interested in kind of diving into deep into the science behind this stuff, I would encourage you to take a look at um, Wolfram's book, A New Kind of Science, which you can read the entire book online. <laughs> I should note that this book, I think, is about 50,000 pages long or something. I don't know. Maybe it's like it, it requires like four iPads or something just to fill up the entire book. Anyway, it's a lot of material, and there's a lot of controversy about this material and this sort of big question, is nature discrete or is it continuous? Does this? But, but, but Wolfram's central point here, a principle, I think, is that this way of thinking, this type of computational way of thinking is relevant to all forms of science. Now, I'm, I'm not here to answer that question or even pretend to know, uh, have an opinion, know the answer to that question. But I do want to sort of say that I just wanted to kind of point this out to you, and I encourage you to take a look at this material. But for us, we're going to go all the way down to the guts of this, and we're going to start in a very, very simple place. We're going to say, we're going to ask ourselves, OK, if these are the defining characteristics of a cellular automaton, what is, and this is, uh, what is the simplest possible scenario we could imagine? Okay, so we started to go down this road, but let's go through each of these and say, what is the simplest possible scenario? Well, a grid of cells, the simplest possible grid of cells would be a one-dimensional grid, a linear grid, so to speak, an array of cells. The simplest possible set of states would be a zero or a one. I suppose the simplest possible set of states would be just zero, but we couldn't possibly get anything out of just having one state. So we at least need two states, zero or one. Now, we have a slightly more interesting question here, which is what is the simplest possible neighborhood? Well, let's say we're talking about this particular cell. We might state that you know, the simplest possible neighborhood, it could be just to the left or just to the right, but I'm going to say the simplest possible neighborhood is the three adjacent cells, this cell and its neighbor to the left and to the right. So if this is the simplest possible neighborhood, one cell with its left and right neighbors, am I recording? Yes. Now we have to ask our question, how do we write the rules for the elementary CA where we get the cell state is a function of its neighboring states at the, in the previous generation? Okay, so this is our project right now. We need to walk through these rules, define them, and then see how they're implemented in code, and then, whoa, look at the results. Have the results achieved anything interesting or a value, or have they achieved complexity? So let's answer that question. So I'm going to erase this. We can, we can kind of remember this. And let's look at a little bit more detail here. So let's say uh, this is our CA. This is our CA at generation, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm being anal retentive here. This is generation zero. Generation zero, this is our CA. Okay, and we're gonna give it a bunch of cells, uh, states. And what I did here is somewhat arbitrarily, I made a bunch of zeros and I gave one cell a state of one. The reason I did that is this is kind of the classic or standard way of demonstrating a CA, is to say, let's have all the cells be off and just put the center one to one. I don't know if that's actually the center one, but close enough. So we have to ask ourselves, how do we evolve generation one? I, I probably shouldn't have used the word evolve. I don't think technically there's any evolutionary computing going on here, although that is something we're going to examine in a future video. How do we compute the next generation would be more accurate. Okay, so this is our neighborhood. Now let's think about this. What is this here? This neighborhood that's going to give us, at the very least, the state for that particular cell at generation one, how many possible ways could that neighborhood be configured? Well, that neighborhood could be 
zero, 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 or zero, zero, one, or zero, one, zero, or zero, one, one, or one, zero, zero, or one, zero, one, or one, one, zero, or one, 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 right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so, you know, we should admit something to ourselves. There's a lot of binary number stuff going on here. And, you know, I, I kind of, I, I enjoy that. I think it's sort of fun. You got zeros and ones, and it makes you look like you're kind of a mad, crazy person with writing all these zeros and ones. But really, um, this might, you might remember this if you, whenever you started first working with computers or learning to program, or if you've had to work with a microcontroller. What we have here are uh, three possible ways of having um, a number with a zero or one in it. Or we have two to the third power possible way configurations or eight possible configurations. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So what's interesting to note is there are only eight possible ways that neighborhood could be configured. So if there's only eight possible ways, why don't we just define an outcome for every possible way? Meaning, if the neighborhood is configured like so, the resulting new um, state should be a zero. If it's configured like so, it should be a zero. If it's configured like so, it should be a one. Then let's say a zero, then a one, then a one, then a one, and then oops, that's a, and then a zero, right? So I made up an arbitrary rule here, but in a Wolfram Elementary CA, this is what is known as a rule set. <laughs> now, somewhere in my magical annotation system to this video, you will see the decimal equivalent of this, right? It's some number. I can't do this binary stuff in my head. I wish I could. That would be cool. I could pause, secretly like pause and re-record the video and make it look like I know this. But um, so if you look at this, this is the rule set. This is called the rule set. And now we have to ask ourselves another interesting question. So we looked at this and said, okay, there are eight possible ways a neighborhood could be configured. Now, how many possible rule sets are there? Well, a rule set requires eight binary numbers. 2 to the 8th power is 256. That I do happen to know by heart or have memorized or somehow calculated in my head. I'm not sure which one. So interestingly enough, there are only, there are only 256 possible ways an element, a Wolfram elementary CA can be defined. Which means we can look at very easily. We, you know, you know, if we had like, if you got like 15 minutes, we can look at, you know, if you're not too busy, we can look at all the possible configurations. We can see all the possible outcomes. And what's really, and we're going to do this in a moment. What's really interesting about this is that um, Wolfram actually categorizes all the possible outcomes into four classifications. One is called uniformity. Another is um, oscillation. I would say oscillation. I, I, don't, I don't remember if that's actually what it's called. I like to think of it alter, alternating values, oscillation. Maybe. Another is, I like to pause this video and fix what I'm thinking, but I'm just going to keep going. Um, another is uh, random. And then we have complexity. So, you know, you might imagine the getting the first two components, the first two classifications, right? If we look at this and we look at, okay, well, 0, 1, 0 in this system, 0, 1, 0 means you get a 1. And let's look at like 0, 0, 1 here would give us this value. 0, 0, 1 gives us a 0. And then uh, 1, 0, 0 gives us a 1. Hey, look at that. We got 0, 1, 1. So we look at this, we could imagine like we're just kind of, sometimes we're flipping numbers, sometimes we're not. We might get like ah, everything just becomes 1s or everything just becomes zeros, or everything goes 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. Repetition, that would be perhaps a better name instead of, I don't know why I was thinking of oscillation. You could think of it as an oscillation between states, but repetition, right? You could have uniformity. Everything tends towards just one state. Everything goes to zero, everything goes to one, or some type of repetition. Zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one. We could compute, we could make up all these songs, like CA songs, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. OK. Um, so that's what you would expect. But what's really shocking or kind of exciting or interesting about this stuff is the fact that we get, not only do we get these sort of obvious results, we get completely random results, essentially. We, we, all, we essentially get a pseudo-random number generator out of just a CA. I hope that's accurate. Um, we also get, we also achieve complexity. We achieve this sort of ordered pattern that is unpredictable. It's, it's not pure random, but it's also not pure repetition either. We get this. We get this uh, intelligent behavior, and this is really this is really interesting that this really highly computational system produces the type 
of, of uh, result that we find in nature. So that's, that's <laughs> I suppose there's a good argument for why we're looking at this stuff in the first place. I'm not timing myself, and I'm just going on and on. So we now need to kind of think about, let's take a look at how this works in code. OK. Um, all right, I want to mention one other thing before we look at the code example. So here's the other thing. In the OK, well, I'm going to go over to the example for a second. And I'm going to open it up. And I'm going to run. I'm going to run rule 222. So what do I mean when I say rule 222? A great resource that you should take a look at is can be found by any Google search. But uh, is this uh, page on, in Wolfram's Math World about elementary cellular automaton, auto automata. It's an automaton. And more, we have, we're talking about many of them. They're automata. But look, we can see here, here is a given rule set. If we have three black cells or three cells with a value of 1, then we get a 0. If we have 1, 1, 0, we get a 0. You can see how this is modeled. Now, if we go down, we can see here, this, by the way, is every, the outcome of every single possible rule. So if we look at, hey, rule 88, and again, rule 88 is just simply the decimal representation of the binary number 88, which would be 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, blah, 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 blah. So, but what are these patterns that are being drawn? How does this relate to a one-dimensional CA? So the thing that I should mention that I think is really important is when you look at sort of visual representations of this stuff, you will see a two-dimensional image. Why is it a two-dimensional image? It's because the way we're visualizing it is we're stacking all the generations. So it's really important to note that the system is a one-dimensional system. This grid is one dimensional. There's a one dimensional array of cells, each with a state. But if, when we want to visualize the result and see what pattern we get, what pattern emerges, what we're doing is we're looking at all the generations stacked. And the reason why I'm belaboring, late belaboring, I'm, I'm just like saying this over and over again is because we really are going to look at something in a moment or in a future video, which is a two dimensional CA. The two dimensional CA is really a grid of cells. And each state we're going to look at as a different frame of animation. But this is one generation, right? In the 2D CA, this is a single generation right here. Yes, <laughs> I'm on camera. And this is a one-dimensional CA where each generation is a, a, a given row in this pattern. So let's take a look. And now if we go back to processing here, we're going to see, first of all, I'm representing. Oh, here, I'm representing the rules as an array. So you can see this is rule 222. This is the binary representation of the number. In the comments, we're showing the decimal. 190, 30, 110, and 90. These are some rules I want to take a look at for the different Wolfram classifications. So let's run this first one. And we can see, yes, this is what you would expect. And in addition to stacking the generations that I've talked about over here, what I'm doing in this particular scenario is letting them scroll by. So we can see this is uniformity. All the cells just tend to the same state. Now let's look at repetition, which what rule 190 is an example of. And we can see this. Now it looks like, I don't know if you, maybe if I zoom in here a little bit, you can see there are these kind of diagonal lines, it looks like. But you can, <laughs> we have some kind of, ah, this is making me crazy. We, have, we can see that it's black, black, white, black, black, white, black, black, white. That's the pattern if you look at any given cell from generation to generation. So how is this stuff being calculated? So I want to look a little bit, I'm going to um, switch here to the kind of simpler example, which is just showing, this is rule 90, I believe, which is, by the way, kind of amazing that with this simple system, what is this pattern? This is the Sierpinski triangle. It's a fractal pattern, which we're going to get into more in future videos or previous videos if you're watching these out of order. <laughs> OK, so what's going on here? The, the, I, you know, I, I just want to point out a few things. One is that the, um, the cells are represented as an array of integers. So a given generation is an array of integers. 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, whatever it is. That is the array. That is that generation. This is not my best video, but I'm going to keep going. Um, OK, this function here, generate, is the key function for how we get the next generation, right? If we have an array of cells, right, we have an array of cells. 
which is this here, what do we need to do to get the next generation? We need to make a new array. We have an array of ints for that one generation. We need to make a new array of ints. Here we go. We've got a new array of ints. And now what do we need to do? For every single cell, we need to say, OK, the next generation's value is a function of the cell to my left, i minus 1, the cell to my right, i plus 1, and me, i. I am i. Over here is i minus 1, or i plus 1, and over here is i minus 1 or whichever way you're looking at this video. Um, OK, once we've calculated for all the cells the next generation, then the actual CA, which is cells, becomes that next generation. So we're doing this goofy thing where we are, where we are creating, we have an array called cells. We're creating a new array called next generation. Right, this might have some values in it. We calculate the next generation values. And as soon as we do that, we say, hey, cells is now this one. And then we make another new array called the next generation. So every generation, we make a new array, calculate everything into the new array, and then, hey, say cells is now that next generation. It was 0, it was 1, 2. So we're not, in this particular example, we're not storing a history. We only have the current generation and the next generation, which is something to think about depending on how you're using this. OK, so the last piece of the code here that I think we should look at is, well, what is this function? This function is saying, hey, I need to get a, a value from my state, by the, but from that neighborhood. My new state is a function of my neighbor's states. And if we go look at this function called rules, if we scroll down, now I've, in this particular example, I've kind of written this in a ridiculous way just to demonstrate what's happening. If my cells are one, if the states are one, 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 Give me the first element from the array. If they're 1, 1, 0, give me the second element. If they're 1, 0, 1, give me the third element, right? So we're, that rule set array, remember, which is the encoding for all of how the cell state change over time, we're getting those results from, the, from, from these configurations. Now, in truth, there's a simpler way to write this function, which is that we could just convert the three-bit number into an index into that array. And you'll see in other of my examples in the repository, it does that. But I think this is kind of a nice way of looking at it at first, to say, like, what is the next generation's value based on three states? I think you can see that. OK, so uh, now that we sort of see how this works, let's go back and just look at a couple more examples. So, we have we saw we saw uniformity we saw repetition i also pointed out that we can get a fractal pattern which we have to ask the question is this is this repetition is this complexity interesting question to ask i'll let you answer that for yourself um, but, or discuss in the comments, comments, um, or I still really, this is like a 30 minute video basically probably, um, or uh, here, let's take a look at rule 30. Oops, come on, run. So rule 30 is a wonderful example of a surprising result, or at least a result that I, when I first looked at this kind of stuff, found surprising, which is that how, this, this rule, these rules are so unbelievably simple, and yet, look at this, complete and total randomness. Now, I don't know, you know, how do we get random numbers out of this? Maybe we could look at, there's all these kind of like little kind of triangular patterns forming. Maybe we could use the areas of those triangles or something like that. But and you know we have to ask our question, is this better than existing pseudo-random number generators generators? Is this worse? But the fact that we can see this completely like non-repeating pattern from such simple rules that just you know, all you can think about is that we're going to get repetition from them um, is, is, is a really interesting result. And at the same time, we can also see just from these simple rules, if we go to rule 110, we can see that we're going to get something that has the properties of a complex system. It's, it's, it's more than the sum of its parts. Simple elements interacting locally with simple rules. The result is ordered, yet unpredictable, intelligent. There's lots to look at here. So this, I think, is a pretty um, unbelievable result, and I think is what makes working with CAs so um, enticing. All right, there's a lot more to kind of say or look at with these. Um, uh, but I think that I'm going to, uh, I mean, I'm definitely going to stop this video now. <laughs> and in the next video, we're going to look at the game of life, which is a 2D CA. Uh, so, um, and